So I am Linda Truax. I am SAI's secretary. And my uh, purpose here right now is to introduce our next speaker, which is Kimberly Clark Sharp. Kimberly is joining us from Seattle, Washington, and she is a person with many credentials to include being a licensed social worker. These are related to her name and her professional career. But I'm very honored to introduce somebody who's important with a more valued characteristic. She is somebody you want to call a friend. Someone I know is Kim, whom I met about 2009. Kim is a near-death experiencer, and for me, her name is related to giving proof of the NDE near-death experience reality. Researchers call these veridical perceptions, fancy words, but they are facts shared by experiencers, which are then verified as being accurate by another party. Kim is cited in most all research books on the subject of proving a near-death experience as very early on, she tells how she found a blue sneaker on the ledge of a hospital building, as it was seen by another experiencer by the name of Maria. This incident happened in 1977, and Kim shared the story in her book, After the Light. But Kim is much more than an experiencer and someone who exposed facts for researchers to use. She has exemplified the meaning of being of service to others. She has a unique ability to help others accept the lessons from their own experience and the experiences of others to enrich their own lives and the lives of others. Kim, my friend, this is now your time to share your presentation and NDE live preview, the Emerald City and a shoe on a ledge. Well, <clears throat> thank you for that introduction. And that's all the time we have. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> Ding. No, hello, everyone. And including people I've known well and long over the years. It's good to see your faces, even remotely. And I look forward to the future when we can all hug. The time will come. But in the meantime, I want to say I'm grateful for the technology that allows this conference to happen. And I'm grateful to SAI for making it happen. So I want to begin with my heart and with my gratitude and with my love. So there I was dead. And to my right was without question heaven because I was being told by that which we call God. I, I have a tendency to say my creator more than anything. Uh, uh, I also sometimes assign God a female gender and call her flow, F-L-O, as in in the flow, because those series of synchronicities that most of us become aware of uh, one time or another in our lives, I believe are God-directed or flow-directed. Anyway, here was God opening a portal on my right which was my heaven, as I was told. And it was so beautiful. It was a, a field of, an expansive field, by the way, <clears throat> of grass, just grass. And then off in the distance, uh, kind of a white picket, not picket fence, white, white fence of some kind, not picket, um, kind of horse corral. And then beyond that, some low trees and then a blue sky. But here's the thing. The grass was not green. It was green. And the sky was not blue. It was blue. I mean, I, I cannot convey the intensity of what I saw. Certainly not of Earth. No, no way. And I've, I've traveled far and wide. Uh, I've been fortunate to have that in my life memory, and I have also yet to see anything like I saw. Also, which was interesting, is that I was aware of the consciousness, if you will, of every single solitary blade of grass. And next time I give a presentation on my near-death experience in person, I have 
uh, a PowerPoint, a new PowerPoint now. I'm not going to share it today, um, but uh, it shows the molecular structure of grass. Just came across this, and it's like a whole bunch of smiling faces, and I thought, wow. Well, anyway, so God likes grass. Go figure. Um, and again, what was God thinking? Because I was shown this, I was on my way, but then God decided to distract me with my potential future. But I'm getting ahead of myself. How did I get dead? I got dead because uh, May 25th, 1970, I was at the Department of Motor Vehicles with my dad in Shawnee Mission, Kansas, where I am from. And uh, I, I felt fine. It was a beautiful Saturday morning. I remember the first part of the morning. Last thing I remember is feeling funny and turning to my dad and saying that I needed to sit down. And he said something about, you know, there weren't any chairs. And I have no earthly memories after that. So I'm going to have to tell you uh, in brief my dad's perspective just to set the stage here. Uh, but apparently I signed in just fine, talked to the clerk, chatted. Uh, we were leaving the building. We were just stepping through the, the doorway when I collapsed into and through his arms. Um, a uniformed nurse happened to be passing by. She ran over and determined that I wasn't breathing and I didn't have a pulse. This predates, especially in Kansas. Um, 911. So at that time, a volunteer fire department from Shawnee Mission was called and an ambulance from the closest major hospital, which was in Kansas City, Missouri, which is about 25 minutes away from my body. So volunteer fire department got there first. My father, again, my only witness, said that they had a brand new portable ventilator. It was like new packaging that they had to open. And they were holding up the hose going, which end, which end? And, and um, <laughs> they didn't know. And, and by the way, there was never any litigation or anything like that, even though my dad was a hotshot Kansas City lawyer. These volunteer firefighters were probably farmers. You know, I mean, how often do you resuscitate a young person? It, there was no bad blood, but they didn't exactly get their full training on this brand new model of ventilator because it had the fascinating features of, well, not only ventilating, but also with a flick of a switch, uh, an expulsion of, of vacuuming air would happen to clear the airway in case there was something blocking <clears throat> the airway. And uh, this happens in uh, food is actually called cafe coronary if it's adults. It's why we tell children, don't run with candy in your mouth. You're going to choke. So this was a good thing to have on a ventilator. But they applied the seal and turned it on, and it was on um, vacuum mode. And whatever oxygen I had left immediately left my body. And, you know, I'm full of jokes. I had the life sucked out of me, and that's just the way it is. It was just so dramatically, but yet kind of funny. Now, you know, I'm like 51 years out of it. Um, they knew immediately what had happened because around my face was black, apparently my fingertips too. So they flipped the switch, started pumping air in, but our lungs are sticky suckers. And when they come in contact with each other, it usually requires uh, a ventilator, which would be an intensive heat intensive care unit to, you know, slowly and carefully separate the tissue. But I didn't have that available to me. And that's always not necessary either, but uh, that would be the safest way to do it. So my lungs could not take this big blast of air going in. So the air had to go somewhere and it did. It found its way out to my skin and uh, something called epithelial Okay, Yvonne, you're the doctor. Epithelial, some big word, dead. <laughs> and um, uh, it, I, I just blew up like a big flesh balloon. There's the layman's terms. So the firefighters turned to my dad and said, I'm 
sorry, there's nothing more we can do. And I'm married to a paramedic firefighter. And I know that in all 50 states in this country, only a physician can declare death. But paramedics have euphemisms like we're not getting a thing or no, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do or don't buy, no, I won't say that show, but oh yes, I will. Don't, don't buy her a long playing record. I mean, that goes back into a different era, but it's just all kinds of euphemisms, some of them dark humor. Um, they gave up. Then from back behind this now, I guess, sizable crowd, because what else is someone gonna do in Kansas on a Saturday morning? But, you know, go down and see that dead girl down by the DMV. I mean, this was, you know, sidewalk theater at this point. And a man swearing like a mule skinner pushed everyone aside and uh, said, you'll never get her to breathe that way. And he did what we now call citizen CPR. Uh, and then he turned to my dad and said, I'm not getting a blankety blank, blank, blank thing. So that's the end of my dad's memory in shock as any parent here can imagine. Um, but his memory picked up again when the ambulance had arrived. There's a big cheer in the audience now uh, because I was breathing on my own, but I was unconscious. So my body was put in the back of the ambulance. My dad jumped in and off we went to St. Luke's Hospital. I have place names for everything. And by the way, I wrote this book called After the Light and I didn't want a journalist finding my medical records before I did. So my admitting medical records, which are now copies of her in my possession, say that my admitting body temperature was 86 degrees, which is a fine summer day, but way too cold for the human body. And that um, primary, and this is a direct quote, primary diagnosis unknown because of snafu with a ventilator. And I thought, I'm a snafu? I mean, pretty, pretty dramatic snafu, but nonetheless. Uh, so what caused me to go down in the first place is unknown. Uh, once in a lifetime cardiac event, a simple faint where my blood pressure bottomed out, we never ever determined. And, you know, I, I mentioned I wrote this book and I hate to give away the ending to a good book, but she lived. So this is what I remember. I remember a woman's voice to my left. And by the way, if they're healthcare professionals listening, this is really important stuff. Uh, I heard a woman's voice to my left saying, I'm not getting a pulse, I'm not getting a pulse. And uh, I, it was confusing because how could she not be getting a pulse if I was listening to her? So I began to oddly comfort her in a way. She was so anxious. And I said, as patiently as I could to a grown up, uh, of course you're getting a pulse, otherwise I wouldn't be speaking. But she ignored me and this went on and on. She got increasingly distressed. So I thought, well, I'm out of here. And I don't know if it was a near death snit or what, but I found myself in a completely different environment. I was surrounded by gray foggy material. It was warm. I had every sense of expectation, calm expectation, like, you know, waiting for the red light to change green or whatever, you know, it's going to happen. Uh, I knew I wasn't alone, but I couldn't see who I was with because of the gray fog. And again, this sense of calm anticipation, waiting for something to show up. And then something showed up, all right. And that would be, again, what I call my creator. Most people say God in the form of a brilliant and super duper powerful uh, light that emerged under me and blasted away the foggy material and whoever else I was in the waiting room with. And um, it was brighter than a million suns. Having not seen a million suns, how do I know this? I don't, and I'm not going to go stare at the sun to prove a point, and I need 999,000 more. It was bright, people. It was, it was, but it didn't hurt my eyes, which brings up a good point. How was I seeing anything? I'm dead. 
my eyeballs were in a human body. How could I see? I haven't figured that one out, but um, same thing is very common in a near-death experience. I'd say 100%. So um, this light went out in all directions um, in, in this kind of thing, this kind of direction to infinity and beyond. If I may quote a good Pixar movie, but at the same time, it was layering on itself. And I somehow understood those were dimensions. And what I was beholding was eternity itself. There was no beginning, there was no end. Dimensions were without end. Uh, I have no words for most of what I'm trying to share because there's just nothing on earth comparable. Also, what I don't have words for is the love of this light. The love that was directed to me personally, um, that includes every one of us, even the biggest jerks on the planet, and that's being nice. This light, what we tell God, is such a powerful love that honestly, if I'd have been in human form, I would have been blasted to smithereens. Uh, I got to communicate with this light. It was a combination of math and music. And when skeptics say, oh, you get what you expect, you know, in a near-death experience, well, excuse me, I don't have skills in math or music. Um, don't ask me to sing. My joke is that in church, I'm asked to lip sync the hymns. I mean, it's bad. Never played an instrument except for the piano. My piano teacher quit on me during the song of the Volga Boatman. Da, 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 da. And math, forget about it. Add, subtract, multiply, divide. I don't do any of it. I, I guess good at the bank. Um, yet the communication was flawless. And it was like telepathy in a way. Uh, it was fantastic. And I've since learned, because so much brain information is coming out now, that until about age 10, didn't know this until maybe 10 years ago, but the point in the brain that perceives math and music's on the same spot until a child is about 10 years old. So the conventional wisdom is now expose your children or grandchildren to music before age 10. It will help their math skills going down the line. So uh, I think our brains were built by God with everything in mind. Um, I asked questions any fool would ask God, like, what the heck are we doing here? Why are we even born? What were, you know, what? And basically it was, yeah, you beat down the door to get born. And it was something we really, 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 really wanted. I have since thought that maybe it was a careful choice, even location, parents, time, uh, events. I, I, but I don't know. I, I wasn't that conscious at, the, at that moment in conversation with God. Uh, what about suffering? Basically, it was, that's the pathway back. That's when it's stress that strengthens us. Um, I still don't understand that. I wouldn't say the Holocaust was a strengthening event, but um, I do my best on earth to relieve the suffering of others. And that's part of my service. So anyway, uh, then I heard what no near-death experiencer wants to hear, and that's that you got to go back. And I argued with God. And again, um, you know, we have free will on this side of the veil. On that side, it's God's playground. Despite my protests, I, um, I was sent back. However, back to the DMV, I did not pass the test. I could not parallel park my car for beans. I, I, so it was like, come back, try another time. So I would get between, I don't know, three or six feet from the curb. And it's true to this day, by the way. And, and I just give up. So I'm sent back, but by golly, I missed my body by the same distance that I missed the curb in my car. It was ridiculous. And here it had the most sacred experience I could possibly imagine. And I made a joke, me, but I made a joke. Um, and I said, gosh, I can't even park myself. So my flesh body, which wasn't looking very good, um, was on its back. And my like spiritual position was similar. I wasn't afraid or anything, but then I saw a man that I didn't recognize. And again, what are my eyeballs doing when they should be in that body? 
Um, but I saw him bend over me and this turned out to be what my dad called the Good Samaritan, that swearing man who came forward and tried again. And the moment his mouth touched mine in, again, citizen CPR, I went back into my body, but through his body. And again, healthcare providers, I went through his body and back into mine. And when I went through his body, I knew everything about the guy, at least emotionally. Um, and I realized, yeah, the, the physical contact was probably a good guy, but mainly he was experiencing compassion. And compassion is one of the highest forms of love I can imagine. And so I had just been with the greatest love of all. Of course, I was going to be drawn to something like that, compassion and love. So I was back in my body and I hated it and I was miserable. And I have no problem whining to God. I mean, I'm, I'm good for that. So I whined to God, you know, get me out of here. It was dark and clammy. And, and I'm thinking this might have been around the time of the emergency room because I, I was very chilly. And oh, clammy, dark, icky. And I felt like I was running around in my physical body, my like my awareness was, but I was trapped. And, so I called out to God, you know, get me out of here. And um, God kindly showed up again. And that's, and now we're back. That's when this vista opened of grass and sky. And I was told that was my heaven, but this portal or window, if I crossed it, that was my borderline. There was no coming back. So it was like, see ya, and off I go. And then, we're back to my opening salvo here. What was God thinking? But there was a big bright light to my left. And I was told that, and within that light was where mountains met water. That's the only, no map, no nothing. And uh, I was told that if I chose to live, that's where I would be living. It wasn't Kansas and Kansas was all I knew. So I didn't care. So I'm back to heaven. Uh, and I, I've said this before, but um, skeptics also sometimes say to near-death experiencers, you expect what you get. We've covered that with math and music. My heaven looked like Kentucky. I have yet to visit the state of Kentucky. I have never been there. Yet somehow, that's my heaven. Anyway, um, I was almost through that window when, boom, another flashlight. And there was like a gallery of people. And they had sort of like placards underneath that I could read like in English. And it was, you know, very common, not a hoity-toity life ahead of me. Uh, you know, best friend, next door neighbor, mentor, colleague, on it went. Again, I didn't know those people, so I'm off into my heaven. And then there was another flash off to my left and it was me being of service. And I said, cool. <laughs> And my, my current joke is that God was a hippie and cool meant an affirmation, you know, like, yeah. And then I was back. And this time I was back for good. So I was sent back to service. Now, God would say I volunteered. I have an issue, but okay. So I'm back and the whole world is different. My metaphor is that my life was a well-placed jigsaw puzzle. And now all the pieces were in the air. I don't know where they went or how they got there. And, and I just knew that ugh, I was suffocating around my family, whom I loved, uh, my birth family. I was suffocating around Kansas. By the way, I also hated change so much that I met a little boy in the seventh grade decided I was going to marry him, Bob Clark. My maiden name was Clark. His name was Clark. I would still be Kim Clark. Wouldn't have to change the monograms on the towels. Thank you very much. So Bob Clark was indeed in my life. I had agreed to marry him. My life was set, except for this agreement that I would be serving others. And I, I recovered. I had to get the heck out of Dodge. Uh, <laughs> kind of literal in Kansas, come to think of it. I had a hamster named Toto. And uh, I kept Toto in a birdcage. I bought a, uh, with Robert Clark's and my dad's help, I bought a 1970 Volkswagen Squareback. 
elm green for those of you of a certain age, a four speed. I didn't know how to do a shift, but I was undaunted. It was a cheaper car. So I had Toto in the front seat and off I was going to find my destiny and where those mountains met water. And I got maybe 25, 30 minutes out and I lost it. It was like, what am I thinking? Uh, I was on approach to I-70, which is the, a big vein of uh, freeway east to west in the central part of the United States. At that time, I-70 was a toll. And I was approaching that slowdown when the weight of my decision hit me big time. And I was terrified because I hated change. And I began to wail out loud to that effect. I hate change. I hate change. Send me back. I changed my mind. That's the only thing I'm going to be happy to change. I hate change. And then I found out how humorous and with me God is. And this is true right to this very chat with you today. Because on approach to the toll booth, there was a big sign that said, change needed. It was like, oh, funny. <laughs> oh, and speaking of Kleenex, I said, I need a Kleenex. And I'm sure my mom put this here, but nonetheless, between Toto and me was a box of Kleenex. It was white and it said Kimberly Clark, which by the way, now you know, I am Kimberly Clark and I'll be in every bathroom you're ever gonna visit for the rest of your life. I don't care if you're in Timbuktu, I will be with you as you pee. Oh, that's probably not very professional. <laughs> it isn't, but I feel like I'm with friends, so thank you. Anyway, um, off I went, and uh, we had a tornado outside of Hayes, Kansas. Not a big one, but enough to drive us uh, there for the night where I picked up a, a human companion, uh, someone I'd gone to college with. I stayed with her until the weather got better. And uh, she, Mary Lou Bola, these people have names, and uh, off we went. Again, uh, she was a happy passenger, but there was something else in the car. And that was my first spiritual, like, woo-woo awareness. By the way, I coined that term, woo-woo. Uh, Yvonne Case invested me with spiritual transformative experiences, but I interrupt myself. Woo-woo, back in the day at Seattle Ions, which... I would like to say is the oldest um, near-death experience support group in the world, June 1982, on this very day, at this very time. And uh, at 1.30 I, in Seattle time, I began this talk. And um, again, there are no coincidences. Also, I don't even know if I'm on anymore. Um, I don't. I need some guidance, and now we're back. Thank you. I'm not the tech person to help. And if it's my energy, I am so sorry. I'm going to interrupt again and say, Yvonne, Kaysen, talking to you. When we had a rehearsal a week ago, I was in a Montana cabin and uh, in the middle of nowhere, and I'd been getting zero to two bars the whole week I was there until we had a rehearsal, and Bruce Grayson came on, and I went to three bars, but his face froze. And I spent all of the introductions looking at Bruce, looking right at me. I talked to Bruce yesterday and he said, funny thing, at a certain point, I was only in a tile. I never saw myself on full screen. He said, now I know why. You had it. I said, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I digress. So um, there was another being in the car. It was such a it was invisible, but that was my introduction to woo-woos, which I started to say, um, I used to say, oh, oh, spiritual transformative experience was a woo-woo because woo-woo was the last sound one heard before one was knocked off of one's spiritual tracks forever. That train's coming down your tracks and you will never get back on like you were before. And then we had, um, at one point, this is all early 80s, uh, uh, named that woo-woo contest. And the person that won a book, Bonnie Long, um, respelled it W-U-W-U -W -U for wild, unexpected, wonderful uh, upsets or something like that anyway. So that was my first woo-woo. And this being uh, essentially drove the car across a good part of Utah while Mary, Sue and I, and uh, you know, fed Toto and 
made ourselves a peanut butter sandwich. We got to our adventures, and I invite you actually to read my book because uh, chapter three is The Road. And it was pretty much the Yellow Brick Road because um, uh, it led to, you know, every, every stop it was, was well, this where we get off? Is this where we get off? I still was looking for when mountains meant water. Denver mm, had the mountains. And I met a celebrity and, inter and had a significant exchange with those celebrities in every stop, by the way. And then it was birth and past Colorado. And then it was um, Salt Lake City. And then it was Lake Tahoe. I might add parenthetically that I knew the sound guy in the Sahara. And I spent a couple of weeks there. I needed some money, got a little job. And I was watching him rehearse the sound and the sky was next to me. And he said, ah, this is boring. You want to get some ice cream? Sure. Well, there's this new place down the road. It has 31 flavors. Woo. I agreed. And that turned out to be a uh, Bill Medley of the, you know, uh, you never hold your hand. I mean, I could name drop. Oh, and I am. Anyway. Then to San Francisco, where by then I'm a full-blown hippie, because the hippie community got me. It was all peace, love. Uh, I liked the drugs. I, I won't kid you. I only took what Mother Nature made, no chemicals. Um, I figured if God made it, it'd be okay for me. But it was ironic, because I lived in Haight-Ashbury, and I lived right on Haight Street. And although it's spelled differently, I thought, this is so ironic. I'm so full of love and I live on hate. Anyway, but that push, it wasn't still mountains, meant water. That push continued and drove Toto and I up to Seattle, Washington. And by the way, Seattle then as now is called the Emerald City. So Toto and I arrived in the Emerald City and Every moment since then has been blessed. Every single moment. I've never applied for a job. I've always been asked to apply and I've gotten it. The work within that job has been hard. Not kidding you. But um, uh, I went to graduate school at the University of Washington. I was asked to apply. I never paid tuition. Things happened that made it free. On and on it went. And all of this led in a more complicated way than I'm going to describe to you. But um, my path led to a place called Harborview Medical Center, the intensive care unit. And by this time, I, my, my whole everything, including my thesis, my master's thesis was about children. My undergraduate degree was in um, child development and mental retardation, as it was called then. And I had a minor in preschool education. That's what I intended to do. I got really involved in, um, and interested in, not involved, but interested in uh, child abuse. And that was my path. I did my cadetship in the Tacoma School District with abused children. I was on a path and God went, ah, nope, my path, not yours. And through odd circumstances, I wound up in intensive care where it was, you know, death and dying. What did I know? It was adults. What do I know? But it turns out I was really, really good being an intensive care unit social worker because I knew death was nothing to fear. And I would sit down to comfort people that were scared of dying or their loved ones that were scared of dying. It was like butterflies came out of my mouth. Dang, I was good, but I couldn't identify the source of it. It was beyond my maturity. I was still pretty young. And, um, but on it went until April of 1977. And that's when a woman named Maria was admitted to Harborview's IC, ICU CCU complex. Harborview, by the way, is a ginormous trauma center. Then again, as now, it serves one fourth of the um, landmass of the United States of America. Big, big place. Maria was admitted unconscious at night, the night before. She was placed on the CCU. I was a social worker, mainly um, we needed to find her next of kin, some money, 
uh, a translator, you know, the whole thing. And there are people who are listening to me speak now who also speak Spanish. Where were you when I needed you? Because I had high school Spanish, un poco espanol. So what I'm going to tell you is in my Americanized language version of this story. But um, Maria was really nice. And we lined up all the services that she needed in three days. On the third day, I was in the chart room where I could also see the monitors of the coronary care unit and someone flatlined. Someone flatlined throughout the day. This was not that big of a deal. Again, a trauma center and part of the University of Washington. So if someone did flatline, you didn't get your doctor, your nurse, and your respiratory therapist. You got your doctor, your attending, your resident, your interns, your nurse, your nursing students, your respiratory therapist, your respiratory therapist. I mean, everyone but food services would show up, including the social worker. Well, it was Maria that was flatlining. I stood in the door and watched this crowded room do an easy resuscitation, and I left to go about my business for the rest of the day. She was still unconscious, but breathing on her own. And then later in the day, I was paged back to the coronary care unit by Maria's nurse. She was so agitated, the nurse was afraid she'd flip back into cardiac arrest. Well, luck of the Kim, part one, I couldn't find the translator. So I had to figure out what she wanted. And um, she told me though first, this is in Kim language, uh, that she was looking down over, she pointed the corner of the ceiling, looking down on what was her resuscitation. She named who was in the room. She identified the equipment. I didn't believe her. Yep, I didn't believe her because I thought I was crazy. There was no uh, near-death experience that I'd ever heard of. Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, I hadn't read. It was published barely, but it hadn't hit big yet. Um, so I had decided clinically that I was nuts and I had, I had the license to prove it. Uh, in fact, there was a time when I used to get up to the unit through the emergency room and there was someone one day that was in two point restraints, which are the wrists and looking miserable. And I asked the resident, you know, what's her story? It was very offhand. He said, oh, she thinks she's been going in and out of her body. So we're sending her up to uh, lock up. I was like, lockup was psych lockup. And I thought, I'm never telling anybody because I was going in and out of my body too. So that was my deep, dark secret. So um, Maria did talk about a bunch of paper that was coming out of a big like, wide mouth machine and being kicked under the bed. Yeah, I knew about that. That's what, after someone dies or recovers, the cardiologist tear off out of the machine, fold it up. And this is back before you know, the Wi-Fi stuff we have now, and then they would study it later. I knew no one had told her about that, but whatever. And then she said like that, no sense of traveling whatsoever. She found herself above the emergency room door and could tell me about the one-way driveway and automatic doors. And I thought, oh, big deal. I still didn't believe her. Her room actually was above the emergency room entrance. So I thought, oh, someone probably pushed your bed by the window at one point. And forgetting that for one, no one's gonna undo all, we call it spaghetti in an ICU setting. What's gonna like unplug everybody to what? Move them across the room to clean the floor? That doesn't make sense. And um, also was ignoring the fact that every emergency room entrance has a roof to protect one from rain or sun or whatever. Uh, so she could not have seen from her window what was below, but okay. Um, then she said, again, like that, she found herself in a different part of the hospital. Here's where, here's where the story really starts, people. And if you listen to nothing else I've said, this is it. Um, she said that she found herself pretty much eyeball to shoelace with a tennis shoe, maybe three or four stories above the ground. She couldn't tell. Wasn't sure what part of the hospital she was in. But the reason she was agitated was that she wanted someone to get the shoe. And she wasn't agitated, scared, or angry or anything. She was excited. I saw a shoe on a ledge. And she said it was dark blue, it was large, uh, a little scuff by the toe. 
there was a lace under the heel that was white that went out. Should I get it confused with any other shoe on the ledge? Uh, details. She wanted me to find the shoe. I wanted to have a beer. I mean, I it, this was getting too uh, for me. So I went outside, um, didn't see anything on a shoe, but I also saw a bird flying onto a ledge and didn't see the bird, which meant I had to go inside. I started on the third floor. Now Maria was on the second floor on the north side of the building. And um, I don't know why I chose the third floor. I, it was just sort of random in my head, but again, back to like, oh, the Kim that I mentioned before, I started on the east side of the building, which was not the side it was on. Harborview on that floor uh, and others above it have almost to the ceiling to floor windows. And I could easily look out without entering anyone's room. They were all my patients anyway. They entirely come from due north. Uh, but on occasion, there'd be a, a metal cart with towels and supplies stacked up. So I'd have to go in and look beyond the cart. Went all the way around, got midway to the, on the west side, there was a cart, so I was like, oh, okay, I go in and I looked down and there was a shoe. And then I found out what it's like to almost really and truly faint. I could not bear my body weight. It's like my knees buckled and I bonked my head against the glass window and out loud I said, this happened to me. And I remember my breath momentarily foggy in the glass and everything fell into place. All those jigsaw puzzles I mentioned, puzzle pieces, they just went, everything was aligned. I saw the picture. I was there. Also, that opened the door to everything. You'll be listening to PMH Outwater tomorrow. Um, she, she, in her research, says, oh, it takes about seven years on average to figure out a near-death experience. And this was seven years, which is interesting. Um, also, I want to give a shout out to Wendy Rose Williams. You're out there somewhere, I know. Uh, Wendy also had a life preview, not of her whole life, but she'll share, uh, I believe, tomorrow that experience. And a woman by the name of uh, Dr. Mary Neal also was shown a future involving her son. You know, so this happens but I've never met anyone whose life was shown. I was also told, and I, this is in After the Light, but I rarely speak of this. I was also told that I would die just before my 35th birthday in a small white plane. So I now, all of that came back to me. So my clock was ticking and I got busy with it. And, um, but first thing I had to do was grab the shoe. And I went back to Two North. Now, again, massively large building, Maria on the second floor north end. This shoe, which, by the way, had a white lace under it, um, was dark blue. If you hear any other color, there's only one shoe. No, I'm the, I'm the only witness. So when I'm gone, it really is urban legend. But um, I've heard other colors of shoes and other stories, other locations, but those roads lead nowhere. It was the shoe. I am the person. I am that healthcare provider. Um, also, my view is called Harbor View for a good reason. There was nothing out there but one lone downtown building about a half a mile away, um, Puget Sound, then Olympic Mountains. I mean, there was no way for Maria to have been in a position to view that shoe during her resuscitation, way out of body. And there's there's the validation. There's the story. I took the shoe back to Maria, and I'm a meanie. I hid it behind my, my back and said, can you tell me about the inside of the shoe? Well, she couldn't. She never saw it. And then I finally produced it. You know, Viva Zapata. I mean, it was like hilarious. I was so dramatic in my three words of Spanish. But uh, back then, uh, unlike now, if you were in the hospital, by the way, you used to stay in the hospital until you were well enough to go home. That doesn't exist any longer. But Maria was in the hospital for three weeks. It's not like, oop, oop, goodbye, never see you again. Um, that 
shoe sat there like the shroud of Turin of Harborview. And that's how the tale got told. It was the nurses. You got to look at the shoe. You got to look at the shoe. And they told others and then other hospitals. And then I was invited to speak to a nursing staff in another hospital in Seattle. And then another hospital. It was the nurses that spread the word about this incredible event. And nurses, by the way, no friends to physicians listening, but nurses have the stories. You know, they're close enough. By the way, so do the nighttime janitors. I know that for a fact. The unit is quiet and they're in there doing their thing and there's a wide awake patient who is scared or sad. And that's another big ear and a secret for inpatient care. It's the nighttime janitors. Anyway, um, then also, Maria was discharged. I followed her in cardiology outpatient clinic for three years. Again, this, this isn't a woman who came and went. And then I went. I actually went on to leave of absence and backpacked around Europe for a bunch of months and came back. One of my graduate students took over my caseload. One day, Maria didn't show up again, and we never saw her again. She was untraceable. I don't know what happened to her. She was originally from Yakima, Washington. Um, did she go back there? Did she die? I, I just don't know. So um, that's the story of the shoe on the ledge. But then other things began to happen. All of those things I saw in the future were beginning to just fire. Um, and I began to do a little bit of work in that without fear, I began to ask every patient that had been resuscitated, what do you remember about being dead? Or words to that effect. And until June, I got nothing. It's like, huh? Then in June, again, of 77, a 16 year old was admitted to ICU. Very unusual for us to admit kids. They would go to our children's hospital, but she was in such dire shape. Harborview was the closest place and she went. She had overdosed. Uh, on barbiturates and it was over a boy and she was in big physical trouble but she came around and I, by now I'm boring myself you know I was like okay what do you remember about your resuscitation and then she said oh umpa. I was like wait what what's an umpa? well umpa is what she called her deceased grandfather before she learned how to say grandpa grandpa died and they're meeting her. Now, this is a suicide. No Helen Brimstone, no ghostly, awful things. This was a kid who was with her loving grandfather, who scooped her up in his arms and sat down and held her like she was still a little thing and comforted her and then said, go back. <laughs> this, is, this is not what's happening. And you're going to basically help other people. You're going to take care of yourself. It'll all work out. And back she went. And then she's looking at me. Well, I was very interested. So I followed. She didn't live. Duh. Uh, I followed her into uh, the back to the inpatient psychiatric lockup. And then across the street to volunteer, voluntary three-story mental health uh, unit there. And then back out into the community. And then guess what? She became the best ambassador for anti-suicide teens that you could imagine because she was you know been there done that and she could get in front of an assembly of similar age kids and say don't do this and be super effective and she did that until she just aged out of it and again didn't leave my life for the longest time got married had a baby moved to someplace and I lost track of her um, but then other things happened too that gallery of people I saw the first one there said best friend. And I remember the faces of all these people. And I was dating a fellow. Again, this is still not, summer now of 1977. And uh, he was um, a sailboat instructor. And he had a client who lived on a sailboat and he needed to stop by and see her on her big residential. She and her son lived on this sailboat, this teak sailboat. And uh, so we climb on board and I look at her and just went, wah, 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 I mean, because there she was, my best friend. God chose a porcupine for my best friend. I'm 
if she were here, she would not disagree. Uh, we've been good for each other in many ways. All these years later, we're the odd couple. She is prickly and I am relentless. <laughs> so when I saw her, it's like, you're my best friend. And she had two middle fingers and was prepared to use them. And this went on for months. She couldn't get rid of me. I was persistent. But you're my best friend. But you're my best friend. And to her perspective, it was like this. Like I was a little robot. But you're my best friend. But you're my best friend. But you're my best friend. And she would say, again, if she were sitting here, I just wore her out and wore her down. She, I give up. I'm your best friend. And she has remained that. Um, the person we know is Ken Ring was one of those images. And I was at Harborview when his book came out. Now it's like early 80s. And um, I bought the book. By now, Raymond Moody's book was out. And um, <laughs> Raymond wasn't in my list. He's become a friend. But it was Ken. And I turned the book over and there's this big, this is a hardback, big picture of Ken. And I remember in front of my bookcase in my office, the shining light, the, the everything about it, time froze. I about had a heart attack because that was another person. How's I ever going to meet Ken Ring? It meant nothing to me. Well, Flo had something else in mind. Ken had been corresponding with a woman by the name of Betty Preston, who had a wowser near-death experience, by the way. Um, again, man, do I have time? I Quickly, Betty's NDE was amazing. She um, was having heart surgery at University of Washington, and her heart, the air hit her heart wrong and began to expand. And the cardiac surgeon had two choices. Watch Betty's heart blow to itty bitty pieces all over the OR, or take a scalpel and stab her in the heart. He chose the latter. Talk about a dramatic way to exit. Anyway, Betty though found herself in a tunnel. That happens sometimes, but it was a tunnel filled with animals. She caught me once saying pets and she said, no, no, no. Animals loved by people. There were horses and dogs and cats and a little fish. And I mean, any kind of critter loved by a human was in this tunnel. And her joke afterwards was, wrong tunnel, because where was where all the humans? And she also was not an animal person before then. Now, needless to say, afterwards, she was big time. And um, anyway, and she, she wrote a wonderful book called uh, Fear Not, if you can ever find a copy. Betty and Ken had become dear pen pals. And Ken decided to come to Seattle and meet this woman. And on that day, I already was running what would evolve into Seattle Lions. I did have my own near-death group and other interests, but we, I was at that time in the Fletcher Organization Spiritual Emergencies Network, and this was under that roof that I had this group, and we had reserved a room. Well, Betty Preston had reserved a room for her church. Same room, same time. Betty Preston and I met. We discovered we had near-death experiences. Experiences, and she said, well, you know, this guy, Ken, Ken Ring's in town to meet me. You want to come over and meet him too? And I went, sure. Wink, wink, universe. So I met Ken. Again, one of my closest friends to this day. And um, we bonded, Ken and I. Uh, by the way, Betty and I and two others went on to found, again, in June 82, second Saturday, Seattle, International Association for Near-Death Studies with Ken's uh, big encouragement, even made business cards for us. And, uh, but one of the nights that Ken was in town, we were sitting at a bar stool at Red Robin, if you're from the Seattle area, waiting for our table. And um, uh, just all things came from that, like the idea of a group, the idea of other groups, um, which now I'm happy to say populate the globe through the International Association, Association for Near-Death Studies. If you're in an IONS group anywhere, I'm your mama. But Ken was a profound influence on me, brought me into IONS when it was a brand new organization. My joke is that I was like the third member, but probably a little further down than that. Nancy Evans-Bush, if you're still on, 
I hope you're nodding your head like one of those little dogs in the back of a car because you were there for all this. And that brings me pretty much to where we are now. God was right. I was sent back to serve. I don't stop. Uh, for those who follow me on Facebook, I just had the mother of all road trips, but it was to be of service. What no one who has been following on Facebook knows is that my friend's husband had just died unexpectedly. And I was with an un inconsolable best friend. That was the reason for the trip. The uh, reward that I got for being a 24 hour seven professional with a profoundly upset and grieving friend is the adventures that we had and our road less traveled and all of that. And um, so just right till showtime, I, I give myself to others, but at the same time, I am mega rewarded as we all are. All we have to do is care. All we have to do is love. All we have to do is show that compassion, patience, kindness. Um, it's not always easy. Like I said, there's some big jerks out there and some of them are beyond jerks. They're dangerous, dangerous people to others. Yet, it is upon us to love them. We can't be God. I don't try to love unconditionally. I do my best. And that's all that's required of us is our best. And so um, I hope with that, because I'm almost up to the end of my time and we can do Q and A if you wish, but um, that's the bottom line. There is a God, God is love. God loves all of us and um, forgives us as we should forgive others if we trip. And if there aren't any questions, I'm gonna to toss in that another one of the gifts that I got afterwards did not end in that invisibility in the car. I began to see what we call angels. I began to see what we, I call negative energy. Some would say evil, demonic stuff. Uh, I began to see way too many dead people. Oh my gosh, and I'm not a medium. I'm a large, <laughs> uh -huh, bang. But anyway, um, I'm, I'm not a medium, but yet things come to me. And uh, I see things uh, on a regular basis. It's just now part of my life. There's also more than that going around too. I've seen my guide. I've seen another guide. I, I've seen creatures I can't define. Um, on this couch behind me um, in January, giving a, a Zoom meeting, at the end, there was like a big old invisibility, uh, male energy, pretty much was smoking a cigar and had his feet up on an ottoman. Like, ah, okay, job well done. Got this one done. Phew. And I'm going, hey, I was here too. I did the work. And it was like, ah, you think. Anyway, so um, life, is, life is like that. And by the way, the things that I tune into are available to everybody. Sometimes it takes some lessons. Sometimes it comes naturally. We all have access to what I call the invisibilities. The room is crowded in our lives. We're surrounded all the time. I consistently count 25 angels around me. My dad said, why 25? When I told him that, I said, I think I'm just really high maintenance. You know, for the angels, it's like, no. Not the Kim. Don't send me to the Kim. I'll be good. I'll be good. I'm sorry. What did I do? Anybody but the Kim. So, yeah. So, thank you for listening. Um, some of you I actually do love, and the others I love from afar through the uh, technology we've talked about. And like I said at the top of this, I look forward to the physical hugs, and they will come. God bless you. Kim, that was wonderful. <laughs> you, you had me laughing, and I've, I've heard your story before, but um, you do have some friends that were listening in today, and one of them, it's really a comment, but I'll make it into a question. Did you ever attend an IANS conference where you also got to visit Raymond Moody's home? And if so, recall that you were at Quality Inn. Were you maybe in Kentucky? Because you said you'd never been to Kentucky, so. Oh, our Raymond didn't live in Kentucky. I've never been to Kentucky. The closest I've come is Cincinnati, 
but it was with Raymond Moody. We stayed in the same hotel, top floor of whatever that hotel is on the river, across from the bridge. And it was a conference that drew people from Kentucky, but um, was not there. And I was pregnant at the time and I did something physically foolish because Raymond was behind a, a podium and um, I can't stand separation from my audience. Plus I don't speak with the notes. I mean, obviously I, you know, I don't, here's my list of what I'm supposed to do today, but um, I, I could, I couldn't be behind a podium. Plus I was really pregnant. So I didn't exactly fit behind the podium. So I went in front of the podium and gave my talk, but I thought, you know, it's kind of dangerous because I was on the lip of the stage and I could have fallen off, but you know, I didn't. And uh, God saw to my safety. That same trip, we were on the uh, top floor. Pee Wee Herman was another guest on the top floor. And that was a hoot because um, that's his persona, not his. I, I meet so many celebrities. It's ridiculous. I could be middle of nowhere and, you know, there's Tom Hanks or, you know, I, that hasn't happened, but you get my drift. So, and have I ever been to an IONS conference? Hmm. My claim to fame is that I am the only person who has never missed an IONS conference, beginning in Pembroke Pines, uh, hello, Nancy Evans Bush, uh, Bruce Grayson, Ken Ring, Raymond Moody, uh, the gang. The gang got, to, the band, the band got back together from the other side, we met up. And that was the very first conference. And uh, after that, uh, it was another three or four years and we met in Pennsylvania. Nancy Evans Bush became president. I talked her into having conferences every year, not because I wanted to learn anything. It was just that I was very attached to the people who attended. For me, it was a big social event. So she agreed and uh, I've never missed a conference. Um, Ever. So yes, I have. Yes, I know Raymond Moody. And I'll tell you something that I have not shared publicly. I was in Raymond Moody's house once when they lived in Virginia, he and his first wife, but I was out of body. And I had been asleep. And uh, I also have those kinds of experiences and lucid dreams. I mean, you know, you got a deck of cards, I can pull one and go, yeah, I've had that experience. Um, but I found myself, I I would say the word would be astral traveling. I don't know. But I knew I was in the Moody's home because uh, I just knew, not like I read the magazine labels, you know, to say, you were in the home of the Moody's. But I could sketch it out. No oh, guess what I did for his then wife, Louise. I was in their living room. And uh, the sun started to come up. This was like hill country. And I thought, oh, they're going to wake up and I'm going to be in Raymond Moody's house. What the heck? And I panicked. And there appeared before me like a panel of different shades of orange. And it was like, press the button to get back to your body. I was like, button, what button? I, I was, it was a panic. So I just basically went bonk and then boom, I was back in my body. And uh, it was Louise Moody who first heard that story because I wanted confirmation. I could sketch out their living room and where the bedrooms were and all that. Never prepared to tell that story, whoever asked me about that relationship. Okay. Cats out of the bag. All right. Well, we do have another one. This is from Yvonne and she asked, are there any events that were in your life preview which did not happen? Perhaps because somebody made a choice not to follow the path that spirit was guiding them? Yeah, good question. That would be me, rebel. Uh, yeah, here's another thing. The contract can be changed. It's been changed plenty for me. I've been so close to death so many times. Um, it's ridiculous. Remember that white plane I was going to die before my 35th birthday? I had no fear, nor did I have secrets. I told people, yeah, I'm going to die before my 31st birthday. So the idea was, you know, for my friends, don't get in a small white plane. But I've been dating for a year and a half an oncologist in Seattle who was also a pilot of a small white plane. Everyone thought for sure I was going to die, but I didn't. Instead, I had been babysitting uh, the children for the divorced Don Sharp. The last name may mean something to people like my husband and me. And um, I've been looking after his children while he chased my housemate. 
and he said, you know, you've been so great. I've got this timeshare on Maui. You want to come down? I can't pay your way, but I've invited a bunch of people, you know, stay for nine days. Uh, you're my guest on the ground. You chase beach boys. There'll be a whole bunch of us. And I was sure I'd never been to Hawaii. So I went and landed at the Maui airport. He put a lay around my neck and gave me the aloha kiss. And I went pretty much blankety blank 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 what the blankety blank 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 because the curtain fell i thought uh, he's my husband and how can that be i'm about to die in a small white plane crash that doesn't make sense but there i saw it if i chose basically so it's like well, that's a head scratcher and i spent three days trying to not have feelings for that guy because and the heat was up oh my gosh i loved him but he was a friend i didn't want to mess it up but on day three um, I learned from him that he hadn't invited anyone else. It was just me. And this was our first date. It lasted nine days. And we kissed. It lasted about a half an hour. Oh my gosh. Glass melted in the condo. We were meant to be together, but I was going to die. So, and again, I've written about this in After the Light, but um, I was to leave and five flights I, I missed in the Maui airport. And then there was like only one flight left to Hawaii, to the main, to Hawaii, <laughs> Oahu. And then taking me back to Seattle uh, on a big plane and storm clouds brew. And uh, this is when you could walk to the tarmac. There's no security. In fact, the Maui airport at that time didn't have walls. And um, the wind blew, the sky was boiling. And I thought this is the plane that's going to, take my life, except that the night before another storm came up and I went outside, it should be a movie, drama, drama. And it was like, I beg God for this man. I beg God for this marriage. I beg God for a new life, please God. And the winds died down, it was pretty amazing. And I knew the contract had been changed. So I was getting on that plane headed into a big storm with all the confidence in the world. Don didn't have that confidence. He ran out in the tarmac. And again, might as well be the end of a movie. You know, the wind's blowing. He's screaming over the engines and the wind. You know, I love you. And that was the first time he said that to me. I love you too. And I later learned he, he was terrified because I had told him to. I was going to die before my 31st birthday in a small white plane. This was a small white plane in April. My birthday is May 23rd. <laughs> So I was right up to showtime, but I knew it, things were different. I knew it. So we did hit that storm and I was in the back because I boarded last and the, oh, the plane was like this, you know, where people are sick, praying out loud, screaming, terrified, no service or anything. We we're just bouncing, bouncing. I sat in the back like an idiot. We're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. The contract's changed. The contract's changed. And we did land safely. And I did marry Mr. Sharp. And that was 35 years ago in July, but we met 39 years ago. So, um, yeah, things can oh. change. Thank you for, for that question, Yvonne. We As a friend, uh -huh. I'm grateful that that preview did not happen. I think many of us are. Um, so, um, I am too. I, I love my life. I love my life dearly. So, I'm, I, But I'm also grateful for every single day. And here's a little trick. I don't fall asleep without gratitude. I go through the day or my life and uh, kind of pays to have insomnia because, you know, I throw logs on the fire. That's what I call it. But those are my prayers for people. And, you know, I, I get a lot done. I'm so grateful for everything. And then when I awaken in the morning, I bake, oh, wait. The sun's kind of out because it's Seattle and we're usually cloudy. But it's another day and I'm alive. And oh, thank you, God, for whatever is going to happen. And this morning it was, thank you, God, for my talk, which I have no notes for. <laughs> but yet I know God will give me the words. And if you were tuning in, you could see I, my head was bowed. I pray before every talk, too. I invite God in and I ask that God give me the words that God wants listeners to hear. And then I just sit back and, like that angel on my couch, smoke a cigar and let her rip. Okay, we got another question from Monique. If we attain any or many of the gifts after a near-death experience or STE, are we meant to use them? 
Is that why we attain them? Yes, would be, oh, my strong opinion. Yeah, I don't know about y'all, but there are times I, I go, no, I'm not doing it. No, no. Uh, oh, there's so many times. Diane Willis, if you're listening, you know, I was in a, uh, her church and I was behind the pulpit my only time and I'd given my you know message and I was on the way to sit down when this voice inside said no talk to the guy in the back you know and it's cat is dead and it's like no I'm not gonna do that I'm already on my way to the seat assistant pastors coming forward no 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 well what happens when I say no to things that we are supposed to do is that I run into pain the opposite of a woo-woo is an ow-ow, if you spell it backwards. And if we don't pursue what we're supposed to be doing, like messing with my hair, uh, is the ow-ows. And as Diane will attest, I went back to the pulpit feeling like an idiot. And I said, okay, the young man there, <laughs> your cat is with you. I don't know what I was talking about. But after the service, he pulled out this 9 by 12 laminated photo of his kitty cat who had died two weeks before. And he was at great peace because his cat was still with him, just invisible. That's all. So yeah, so I would say obey the urge, uh, even though you might feel like a complete idiot and might even be perceived as a complete idiot, but you're doing the right thing to follow through in the fulfillment of any and all gifts. Sounds good. So we do have another one. This is from Joshua and he's asking, uh, do you think some NDEs are planned before incarnating or are they more accidents, so to speak? I am not the creator. That's a very interesting question, Joshua, because uh, my metaphor about life is that we're born and we have the board, like a monopoly board. I didn't think of any game board ahead of us. The board is set. Those are the squares. We are the dice. We throw the dice. We move ourselves three squares. We land in jail, maybe because we stole something. We made a mistake. Well, there's a lesson out of that. It was meant to happen. We might throw the dice. We go forward 10. Oops, you're going to drop dead and the EMTs are going to not figure out the ventilator and you're going to have a near-death experience. Or I might have thrown nine and skipped that. I don't know, but I, I do believe that a large part of our lives, this is just Kim talking, is predestined, but within those squares on the board, within that destiny, there are things that we are to fulfill. I certainly uh, can't figure it out, but it drives me nuts. Thank you for asking, but it does. I don't know uh, what's destiny and what's my will. And I'm very strong willed. And uh, my own daughter's asked me that. And just in the last few days, and she said, you're like a tractor pull. So like, what you want, you get. I said, well, not always. <laughs> so I, I don't know, but it might be. In my case, I would say yes. However, I don't know about in your case. Okay, well, we're down to a minute and 18 questions. So I'm just going to give you one more here because I think it's going to finish off our time. Moment, <laughs> Those 17 questions that aren't going to be answered, I can be reached through um, Seattle Lions website at seattlelions.org. Or if you want to join in the 4,000 plus emails I have on my own personal email, it's K I M N D E for near-death experiences at aol.com i'm the last person on aol shouldn't be hard to find me okay so the last one i wanted to give this comes from jody and the question is i have heard about these fairies or god watching over every blade of grass etc so how do we go about cutting our grass and pulling and killing weeds killing the indoor bugs I have no Insights. problem spotting a spider, by the way. It's none. I got free will here. I cut our grass. Um, I, uh, it, but there, there's a, a limit. We also had a huge raccoon problem here. And of course, Critter Control wanted to uh, kill them all. Well, that wasn't going to happen. So I became the raccoon whisperer. And 
personally transported to a welcome habitat, 11 raccoons. So um, I'm kind of animals, but when it comes to weeds, I, I, this is, you know, I live in a place that's imbued with native vibes. Uh, Washington state has more tribes than any other part of the country. They're not big, but there's a lot. And our culture is soaked. And I also have learned to uh, back to gratitude. You know, thank you weed for showing up and now you gotta go. Thank you raccoon for showing up. You're gonna live, but not here. Um, and mowing the grass doesn't hurt them. It stimulates them, so that works. But yeah, that's my rationalization. But again, I'll kill a spider. But thanks for being here. Okay, Kim, well, that's going to wrap up our time with you today. And I want to let you know that I've thoroughly enjoyed the time you spent visiting with us. Uh, for the rest of our attendees, we're going to be going on to a break. And if you want to get hold of Kim, she did give her email out. It's, and we'll put it in the comments. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you so much for your attention here. Have a wonderful rest of the conference, too. I will. Okay. Bye.